Hi, my name's Evelyn. This is my nursing related video. First thing I'm going to do, because I had no right the case, is I'm going to go and check my machine out. So I'm going to make sure it's plugged into power, make sure my tanks and pipe pressure is hooked up. I'll make sure my tank pressure is above 1,000 for my oxygen, above 745 for my nitrous, and then I'll just make sure I have an ambu bag. And then I'll go around to the front and check out my interlock system, check my gases, make sure this cap screwed on tight. Then I can do my low pressure screen check. I will pass. And then I'll turn on the machine. And then I'll check my CO2 absorber, my scavenger system, and then my O2 analyzer to room air and to 100% oxygen. And then after that, I can check out my monitors once they turn on and all my schools. And then I'll do a high pressure system check. So I'll turn my APL valve all the way to occluded. I will occlude my circuit and then I'll O2 flush until it is 30 centimeters of water. It should stay, the needle should stay at 30 centimeters of water and that's how I know it doesn't leak. Once that's done, I can check my manual and my ventilation systems and then that should all check out. I should also check my flow meters and my leak 25 and make sure there's no leaks there and also that I can't do a um, harmful mixture of gas for my patient. So once that's checked out, then I can set up my room. So I'll just grab my, I know we're doing a broken wrist, so we're doing an ORIF on a 40 year old male who's 75 kilograms of ASF1 and VMI24. So overall pretty healthy. Um, my common IV drugs, I'll need to grab some Dazlan, fentanyl, lidocaine, propofol, Rock potentially SIBO for maintenance and Zofran. And so my emergency apples will be on standby. Then I'll grab my blades. So I'll have a Mac 3 or 4 or a Miller 2 or 3 for this man. And then I'll have Glidescope, emergency airway card, Elmaze, McGrath, stuff like that just in case. And then I'll have my ETPs. So I'll have an 8 but a half size up and half size down just in case it's a different size than I expect. Oral airways. I'll have my nerve simulator. And then once I have those things, I'll have some lube, also a stylet. Then I'll grab eight crate foams for positioning. And now I need to gather some axillary block things because I'm doing a block with this case also. So I'll have my ultrasound machine. I'll have a sterile sleeve, um, some gel, a nerve block tray. I'll have 30 mils of PPK and half percent, five centimeters, 22 gauge feed bevel simplex needle, peripheral nerve stimulator, um, an open injection pressure monitoring system, stop cocks, and it's for hydro dissection, quarter prep, my still gloves. Um, and then I'll just set up my nerve stimulator back here and sedation meds. So we're doing reset for this, um, and then my local anesthetic meds. So now I can go meet my patient with my room set up. So this is my patient. I'll just do an interview. So they have, I'll find out they have no significant medical history, no medications that they're chronically taking, no MH history, no allergies. Um, their NPO status is acceptable for the case. And some of their history, like I said, it's ASA1. Um, they, all their labs are within normal ranges. And their physical exam, I would go into next. I don't know, I would just check if they had some rat labs done while I'm doing that. Make sure they have CBC, VMP, PTINR, blood type and screen just in case on the EKG. Um, and then my physical assessment, I'll look into their heart and lungs. I'll do a mom potty. I'll see their insulin resistance. I'll see their neck thickness. And then I'll make sure they can do chin to chest. And then I'll do a three, three, two. And then I'll just make sure they don't have a beard or see if they can shave that. So now I'll go over the block with them after I've done my physical and my interview with the patient. So this surgery is below your elbow. Obviously it's your wrist. Um, and then this is this block is better than an ISB block, obviously. And then a supraclavicular block is better than, it's not done under general anesthesia because I need you to tell me if I am poking your nerves or if anything's super uncomfortable. Um, and then I need the patient to communicate that all with me. So then I'll go over risks, uh, consent and benefits and alternatives. So risks are systemic toxic toxicity from the intravascular injection, bleeding, hematoma, minor nerve damage, and then benefits are post-op pain control. Um, this is a block that you could do under, you could make it a surgical block, but this patient doesn't want to remember anything, so we're going to do general anesthesia as well. Um, you could avoid general anesthesia though, so that's a benefit. So then higher pain is an alternative. You would have general anesthesia only. You could have IP opioids. Um, but we talk about all of that and then we would get consent, so they would sign that for the anesthesia and the block. And then I did surgical site and initial it and just make sure the patient agrees with the spot. Then we would sedate them with two milligrams of Versed and then we would position the patient. So I'd stick all my SPO2, my monitors, my EKG, blood pressure, needle cannula if you needed. And then they would just be supine and they would have a pillow for comfort in any positioning um, places that they needed. But their positioning is going to be like this. They're going to be, their arm's going to be at a right angle. It's going to be abduction of the arm, max of 90 degrees for good patient ergonomics. Um, then I can still prep 
and then I'll store a glove myself, mask, and then I can do a timeout before I do the procedure. So is this the right patient, the right spot, the right dose, the right drug, um, the right procedure. And then I'll do my landmarks. I'll identify my landmarks and my nerve soon. So externally, the arm's like this at 90 degrees, and I'll just start at the armpit. And typically this um, nerve is one to three centimeters below the skin, and the axillary artery is around that area as well. So it's pretty shallow. But I'm looking for the median nerve, and that is superficial and lateral to the artery, the ulnar nerve, which is superficial and medial to the artery, and then the radial nerve, that is posterior and lateral or medial to the artery, depending on anatomy. And then the nerves are all kind of rum around the axillary artery, like I described. Then the musculocutaneous nerve is going to be a little further off in the fascia layer between the biceps and the chorus brachialis muscle. And it's often a hypoechoic flattened oval structure with a bright hyperechoic rim, like a snake eye. And then my sterile advancement angle, once I identify all these landmarks, is it is inserted shallowly, shallowly one to three centimeters in plane, um, anterior to posterior, relative to the axillary artery. And then all needle redirections are done through the same needle insertion site through our skin wheel that we made. And then if you're using a stern, uh, nerve stimulator, like we are for this case, it, the reading needs to be 0.4 is the best, but at least between 0.3 and 0.5 if you're less then you're probably in the nerve and if you're more you're probably too far away from the nerve so the ulnar nerve if i'm in the right spot you'll see a thumb adduction and then median nerve two to three fingers will start flexing um the, these two two to three fingers will start flexing and then musculocutaneous i'll have bicep flexion and then radial i'll have triceps extension so your arm will be doing some good twitching so then my dosing routine i'll aspirate once i find my right spot and then I'll inject about five mils around each of the rum nerves for a total of 15 mils, then four mils around the musculocutaneous nerve. And then I just need to talk to my patient and assess to see if it's starting to be tingling um, from elbow down and maybe biceps down. So um, then once the skin, oh, the skin over the deltoid muscle is not anesthetized, and so they might have sensation in their Anyway, so I'll have my patient come over and then we will just identify our stuff here. Okay, so my patient's going to be in a, yeah, whichever arm you want to do, uh, this position. And they're ideally supine, and we are supine in this situation. Can you off it? Do you want me to just stand up? Too? Yeah, let's see if it, let's see if we get the same. So I identified my uh, landmarks. So this is my axillary artery. And then I have ulnar nerve right here. I have radial nerve right here. And then I have median nerve right here. And my musculocutaneous nerve is right here. And it's pretty very clear, in fact. And so her lats are right here. Humerus is right here. Corker brachialis is right here. And then I would um, do anterior to posterior. So we'd go here, 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 here or here, 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 so. Um, so then once I have that set up, my block is going. Now I can do my induction. So I'll just have my patient relax. I can position her arm back to the um, other side and I'll just do my 100% oxygen for three to five minutes, six to eight liters. And then um, the, the, the patient will be breathing deeply. The mask should be sealed um, after that. After they've been breathing for three to five minutes, then I can take one final look at my monitors. I'll do my IV induction. So I'll use my fentanyl, my lidocaine, my propofol, and then I'll intubate once they're in stage three. So I can do flash reflex. I can look at their eyes and see where they are, see if they're fully re re relaxed, or I can see if they stop breathing even. And then I'll intubate the patient. So I have my stylated uh, tube, and then I'll have my circulator standing by for cryopod pressure, but I'll just open their mouth make sure I have good alignment of their airways. And then I'll visualize cords so I can see cords. I make sure not to rock back on their teeth. I don't need cricoid pressure. And then I'll just approach the cords. My circulator will take out my stylet. And then I'll advance it through. And then after that, I can pick up my circuit. And 
And then I'll just check for missing chest drive. I can listen for also breath sounds. I can check my ATCO2. And then once I have all those confirmations of missing, then I can inflate my cuff. And then I'll just secure it with tape. And then after that, I'll turn on my SIBO and then I'll reduce my oxygen to two liters per minute. And then I'll just assess loss of consciousness again and make sure that intubation went smoothly. Um, I'll make sure they're breathing well still, double check that everything worked. And then I'll just make sure that I can pad all the pressure points for the case and that will be the end of this video.